Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and today we are working through Russian aircraft that fought on the Eastern Front, and we are going to move into something probably one of the cutest little airplanes I've ever seen, although you don't want to call fighters cute. This one was cute both in its model and in it though that I'm going to use today and, and in its diminutive nature against the Germans. This is the Polikarov, the I-16. Its nickname, Greg, was either the donkey or the burrow by pilots. You can believe that or not. Now today, Greg has spared no expense. We've actually, my demiurgic assistant has gone out and Greg's like, oh, he got it has gone out and uh, this is what the Cossacks or the uh, Mongols wore on the Russian steppes. They blended right in, right Greg? This would strike terror in anyone's... Thank you, Greg. This is almost humiliating with the little multicolored tassels here, but it's just a little bit loud. So here we go, off camera to the Greggy. I got it. So today, the I-16 is interesting in that, well, first of all, I can throw up a plan view if you can see it. <laughs> this is more like a bookmark. This is, I think this is the smallest model we've ever used with the exception of maybe that uh, P-39 we used a year or so ago. But this is the Polikarov. Greg can throw up a plan view of the airplane. Uh, it was the first low-wing monoplane with retractable landing gear that went into service, if you can believe that. So it was a, a very significant airplane at the time it had to achieve operational status. It was designed by N.N. Polikarov. It first flew in 1933. It entered operational service in 1935. It was retired with the Spanish Air Force. Now, this thing, Greg can throw up a picture, but you know, pretty much an open cockpit kind of looks like the pea shooter, the Boeing pea shooter, but with retractable landing gear. Um, but this thing made it all the way out to the Spanish Air Force in 1953. Now you have to ask yourself, and I don't know what they were doing in the Spanish Air Force with this thing, but what was it doing in operational service anywhere by 1953? But it made it out that far. There were 6,848 of these produced which was a fairly high build rate. The test pilot that flew it was Valery Chekolov. I hope I didn't screw up his name. He was the first guy that flew it. Now, there are a couple of things about this that, that are completely misnomers. The airplane got a reputation that it was nasty in spins. And some of these other short wing, short fuselage aircraft actually were nasty in spins. It was not, so much so that Valeri took it up and spun it about 75 times in a row, and he could not get it to, um, to have a nasty. So it, it was, did not have bad handling characteristics, unlike some of the, uh, the things that have been written about it. it. It actually performed fairly well. The aircraft saw combat in the Spanish Civil War. Um, it fought in China against the Nakajima, the KI. 27, so it actually saw combat there. And then in Barbarossa, 1,635 of these were on the line when the Germans attacked. Now to show you how ferocious that was, so little over 1,600, in two days of combat, in two days of combat, there were 937 of them left. So they lost a big chunk of the fleet in two days. And if you start going out exponentially on this, they, they were just being further and further depleted because they were one of the few frontline fighters. Now, what did this stack up against? It, stuck a, uh, it would stack up against an ME-109E, which would be what it was fighting comparable. It could outturn an ME-109, but that was about it. If it got into combat, it could not out, it could not outclimb it, uh, and it, it could not outdive it. So Russians uh, learned quickly, probably because of those heavy combat losses, that in the ME-109, you wanted to get into a turning fight with them because it could outturn the airplane. Now, what were the comparable airplanes? The Brewster Buffalo, 
the Seversky, the P35, we talked about the Boeing B, uh, P26, and the Fiat G50 were all comparable aircraft. So Greg can go out and, uh, and find his, his, uh, all of his pictures of the comparable airplanes. But this one, uh, I think, you know, it's a really cool airplane when you think about it. And it, it represents, in my mind, on the technology really from with the, the way it kind of had a little bit of an open cockpit and, and how it was designed, really that transition from those monoplanes, it actually transitioned from the, uh, the I-15 to this airplane. So you can go throw that up. It transitioned, but this was really the first step into the Soviets had very capable fighters later, like the Yaks. Uh, we talked about the MiG-3. Some of the other fighters they produced were quite capable, but this was the first step. And actually, at 304 miles an hour, when it came into being in the early 30s, mid-30s, not pretty darn fast, if you think about uh, where, uh, where we were at at that time. And I've talked about some of those bombers. Now, go back, though, and think about, we talked about some of those fast bombers and those destroyers. This was pretty comparable comparable or actually a little bit slower. So I'm going to put this down and I'm going to do my salute today. Now Greg, Greg you have spared no expense and you have spared no uh, imagination as well. This is requires a lot of imagination. This is a Kickapoo fruit shine. Real sugar, that, that's always a jump, jump off there. Sangria flavored carbonated drink. Hmm, maybe this could be a good one, Greg. Uh, 180 calories, uh, no fat, 44 grams of sugar, got a lot of sugar in it. So hopefully uh, this isn't too, uh, too nasty. But what I want to do today, and I haven't really done that, but I am going to salute the pilots that actually flew this airplane. If you think about it, and we've talked about the savage nature of the German-Russian conflict in that arena, if you look at the bravery that it took to go and get into the cockpit of one of those airplanes, remember the fighting uh, on Russia was very short, uh, the short fields, in other words, the, the front was very close to where the aerodromes were. A lot of cases, uh, the Germans were moving so fast, they were uh, overrunning uh, these, these uh, airfields, capturing airplanes, what we'll talk about after the drink. But if you think after two days of fighting, you lose 30% of your fleet, 35% of your fleet in two days, and then exponentially, two days later, 50% of your fleet is gone. And these guys went up and did it every day. So you have to salute the bravery of the pilots that went out and did that in, in really an, in not, I wouldn't say an inferior machine, but clearly outclassed. They did it every day, they got into that machine, and ultimately Russian tenacity is what really turned the tide against the Germans. The Russians just refused to give up, no matter how uh, ugly the Germans were to them and how badly they treated the population, the Russians just would not yield. So to the I-16 pilots that refused to yield, and probably a, a big portion of them sacrificed their lives early in the conflict in order just to slow the Russians down, or the Germans down, I salute you. Here we go, Greg. Death by Sangria. Oh, oh. This is actually not bad, Greg. I may keep this one for a little while. Mmm. I like that one. Good job, Greg. After, what, six basically diesel fuel coolant tasting. This time, see, there's a third there. So, the, but I have to put it down because there's too much sugar in it for me. But, what happened a lot, one of the th questions is, why did the Russians have such high combat losses in that period? A lot of times they were ramming. Uh, the Russians, uh, in many cases, would ram the Henkel 111s, uh, and and they were going after the bombers. They did not care about the fighters. They were going after 
the the German tactical bombers, the JU-88s or the uh, the HU-111s. So they they would end up ramming these airplanes, and with a little tiny airplane like that, you're not going to survive that. Most of the time, you're not going to survive that. So there was a great deal of ramming going on early in the war, and you can read all kinds of accounts of the Russians, uh, as I said, just not yielding. Now, the aircraft was completely outclassed, as we talked about with the ME-109E, and by 1943, it was pretty much, with, pretty much withdrawn from service. It had that fairly high build rate that we also saw uh, with the Tupolev that we've talked about and the MiG. The MiG, not so much, but, but the other aircraft. So by 1943, the aircraft was being retired and then it would, would go away. Now, like we talked about with other types, both the Finns captured some of these and the uh, Germans captured quite a few and would use them against the Russians. It would fly against uh, the Russians. So the aircraft was soldiered on in uh, some of the Axis liveries or their opponent's livery. The, China, the Japanese even captured a few in China and, and used them, which is kind of interesting. But uh, by, the, by the mid part of the war, this airplane was, was, complete, was hopelessly outclassed. And as I did the research, as I said, with the Spanish, it retired in uh, 1953. And I have no idea what they were doing with it. If anybody, if in the comment section you know what the Spaniards were doing with that airplane that late uh, after the war, I'd be really interested. Uh, it was also used, we've talked about parasites. It was actually used as a parasite uh, in experiments with the tuple of the TB3. So remember we talked about using the, um, the fighter and then you would fly the bomber loaded with uh, explosives into the target. The Germans... Uh, with the Mistel were really good because that had actually a shape charge in the front of it. But the Russians actually experimented. And think about the size of this airplane. It actually makes perfect sense as a parasite because of the weight, uh, the weight advantage. So they did use that with the TB3, but those were just experiments. And then it went by the wayside. So what happened to this airplane? Well, this is one, Greg, in inventory that there actually are a few in museums. There are three of them in the United States, if you can believe that. Two are airworthy. One, uh, our good friend Kermit Weeks down there is in the process of rebuilding one. I don't know whether it's airworthy or not yet. So if you, you do have an opportunity to actually see these in the air, which I think is, is kind of interesting. Uh, now, the one thing I will tell you is on the side of this, Greg, in Russian, what it says is, watch Warbird Wednesday. That's what it says. See, they were way ahead of their time. So uh, that's the writing on that airplane. Now you can, you, Christmas is coming, and for that little airplane fiend in your household, you can get this coloring book, and there's all kinds of cool stuff in there, the airplanes, that even uh, the airplane that we're talking about today is in there. And actually, that uh, this airplane is on that. It's also on the back cover. So you can go out, click in the uh, product description that's on this video, and Jason will happily send one of these out to you um, before Christmas. So you can have this as a Christmas gift. Now also a little thing I'll pass on there, Greg, if you order $100 or more, free shipping. Free shipping. There's a lot of cool stuff on the web store. You know, we have those jackets and a lot of other neat stuff. Go out to the the web store and, and check that out. There's a lot of really cool gifts prior to Christmas. Now, if you came across this and you like Warbird Wednesday and you like the fact, by the way, no colored glasses today, Greg. We're inside. I'm not looking into the sun. And I'm in shorts in Palm Springs in, uh, in, in pretty much December, the end of November. Uh, it's because we're unseasonably warm here, warm here. But if you like Warbird Wednesday, subscribe to the channel. Give us a like on uh, YouTube, like us on Facebook. If you want to give the gift that keeps on giving, forward us to your friends who are aviation enthusiasts, Warbird Wednesday. We've got almost 100 episodes in the can here, which is exciting. We are going to work through the British and some of the French aircraft as we kind of round out uh, World War II. And remember, we cannot do this. You see all these airplanes. We're in the European hangar. We cannot fly the airplanes. We've got 75 aircraft in inventory. 
We fly about 10 of them. We cannot restore the airplanes or fly them without your generous donation. So click on that donation link. We can always use your donation here as it comes to the end of the year. It is tax deductible, Greg. Did you know that? Very cool. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.